Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. My first marriage only lasted six months. Nina and I began dating in 10th grade and slept together for the first time on the night we graduated high school. We married at the end of our senior year of college with the financial and emotional help of my parents. They always treated her as the daughter they never had, which wasn't hard since after her mother's death, she was always at our house. Neither of us had ever dated much less slept with anyone else, at least I hadn't. Nina was very gullible. She believed every single article in Cosmo magazine, like it was the Sermon on the Mount. She wasn't the smartest girl in town. I thought I was smart enough for both of us. I was wrong. Lord knows she was the prettiest and probably had the strongest sex drive of any girl in town. Some nights she just plain wore me out. Not that I was complaining. Nina was a daddy girl. She wasn't as close with her mother, which filled her with guilt when Nina's mother committed suicide in our junior year in college. As if that wasn't devastating enough in less than a year Nina's father remarried a woman who hated Nina and according to Nina burned all the photos of Nina and her late mother that hung on the walls of their home. To mark the territory as her own, she replaced them with photos of her three children. Nina's father always sided with his new wife, or else he got no sex. Nina claimed she wasn't allowed at Thanksgiving dinner because her stepmother explained that Thanksgiving was for family and Nina wasn't family. Nina and I eloped and never again saw her father. Her stepmother wouldn't allow him to see us. Of course, Nina was emotionally crushed by losing both her mother and father, despite my constantly trying to console her. These events left a hole in her heart that I tried to fill with love, affection, and frequent visits to her favorite ice cream parlor. After we graduated, I worked at a Philadelphia ad agency writing ads. My wife worked there as an artist. We both enjoyed our work and our colleagues. My wife perhaps a little too much. On an average Monday morning, everyone came to work hungover and bragging about all the sex they had that weekend. Remember these people worked in advertising, so I knew that 99% of their bragging stories were exaggerations or outright lies. My wife, however, ate up these X-rated stories the other women shared about the sexual Olympics they competed in every weekend claiming to have had more orgasms than Taylor Swift had hit records. I just laughed at it all this bullshit, but my wife drank it all in. Some of the women laughed at my monogamous wife and cajoled her to join them bar or bed hopping one weekend at their favorite country and western bar. They said it was filled with real cowboys. They also claimed that monogamy was monotony. None of these women were married. Most were divorced. Some had multiple divorces and were treated for multiple STDs which they laughed about. They convinced her that somehow through some kind of black magic, sleeping with other men would improve our marriage and in addition to making her happy would make me happy. How delusional must Nina have been to believe that? The first time she brought this up I thought she was kidding and laughed it off and told her that once again she was being gullible. Boy was that a mistake it just angered her. She said that just because I knew most of the answers each night when we watched the TV show Jeopardy didn't mean I was smart, just that I had a good memory. The next Saturday evening while I was cleaning up from washing the car she came downstairs dressed like a movie version of a high-class call girl with a red dress too high at the bottom and too low at the top revealing neither a bra or panties. My pretty woman plainly wanted to go out and later have intimacy. It was clear what she was advertising and I was an eager customer. When I asked for time to clean up and get dressed, she informed me that she was going out clubbing without me, but with women from the office and might not be home until late tonight or maybe Sunday night. You're kidding, right? I asked. She shook her head no. Are you out of your freaking mind? I yelled. She cried and said she was sorry, but I wasn't enough for her in bed that she wanted. Absolutely needed to experience sex with another man or two or three. She claimed that after listening to her friends, she too now craved a cowboy. Where in hell will you find a real cowboy in downtown Philadelphia? I asked. So? You're hell-bent on spreading your legs for some a-hole just because he's wearing a cowboy hat? I again asked. In her warped universe, she claimed that this would be good for me too. She would return a more accomplished lover. She was adamant about this and I knew arguing with her would be a waste of time. I could literally feel my heart breaking. The room began spinning and I had to sit down before I fell down. I tried to catch my breath. My heart raced so hard it was as if I had just run a marathon. Even if I convinced her not to go this time, I knew she would sneak out behind my back in the near future. I breathlessly asked her how important this was to her on a scale of 1 to 10. She quickly answered 10. 
I rubbed my closed eyes. I hoped this was a nightmare and would soon wake up. But I opened my eyes and saw that this nightmare was real. When I asked her if this was more important than our marriage, she was silent and I knew our marriage was over. If you walk out that door I will divorce you. I screamed. She turned to me and laughed. My friends say that if we divorce, you'll have to pay me alimony for the rest of my life and I'll still be able to sleep with whomever I want. A car outside our apartment honked its horn and my wife ran out of the door yelling how I just wasn't man enough for her in bed. No one man was, but she would make it up to me when she returned because of how much I meant to her, though she had just demonstrated that my broken heart and my hurt feelings meant nothing to her. I cried nonstop in the shower then packed my bags, left my wedding ring on the kitchen table next to a note telling my wife that I would see a lawyer on Monday, and since our marriage was so short, seek an annulment. I had no interest in staying around begging and playing the victim or pick-me game while my wife pretended to be a call girl who wasn't even smart enough to get paid. At work on Monday, I was the laughing stock as my wife came into work with hickeys all over her neck and as she would later discover herpes. She stood at the water cooler giving a group of her co-conspirators or witches coven as I chose to call them, a blow-by-blow -blow description of her weekend and I do mean blow-by-blow, -blow, which also pissed me off because she had never given me oral. Apparently, she needed two men at the same time to achieve the big, oh, I walked into my boss office, gave notice, and immediately left never to return, or see my wife again except at the annulment hearing. I gathered that my wife was glad that I ended the marriage because I was just a boat anchor preventing her from her sexual dream of sleeping with the entire Philadelphia Eagles football team to fulfill her sexual destiny or some such crap. Nina was however furious when the judge explained to her that the annulment of a six-month marriage didn't entitle her to any alimony much less the lifetime of alimony promised to her by her friends. The judge had to threaten her with contempt and jail time before she stopped screaming, but my girlfriend said, at him, though I am basically a vengeful person thanks to my mother's Sicilian heritage, I never thought of getting revenge on Nina. What she was doing to herself was far more destructive than any nefarious plot I could ever envision. I spent many an evening with a glass of bourbon, trying to understand what had happened to my wife and my life. How did she go from 0 to 304 so quickly? None of it ever made any sense to me. A few months later I went on my first date of my life with a woman other than Nina. We met in church. It seemed like a safe place to meet a good moral woman. I had no interest in a woman I might meet in a bar. She was adorable, with dark black hair. Her body was nothing to write home about, but neither was mine. I wasn't looking for a beauty queen. I had high hopes for again finding love. They say once burned twice something else. I told her that I had friends who had an open marriage and wondered what she thought about that. She smiled and said that being monogamous wasn't natural and she understood and was not frightened by the concept of an open marriage. She was happy that I also felt that way because we lived in a new age with new rules and morals. I was happy with the old rules and morals, so I got up and drove her straight home in silence. I didn't need that shit in my life again. What the hell is wrong with women today? Some sociologists claim that women were always this way, but constrained by fears of pregnancy. Modern birth control pills changed all that, and now many women believe they were free of old fears and old morality. Two years later Nina came to my apartment claiming that she would forgive me for annulling our marriage if we resumed our relationship. I laughed in her face. Then she began begging me to take her back. Though she didn't appear pregnant, when I asked how pregnant she was, she broke down crying as Caitlin. My new wife walked up behind me and put her arms around my waist. I am ashamed to admit that I smirked as I closed the door and never again saw Nina. I learned from mutual friends that she terminated the pregnancy and was racking up a body count greater than Jack the Ripper after visiting local bars each weekend. On some nights she was passed around more than a bong at a pot party. About more two years later I ran into her stepmother at a supermarket. She told me that Nina had a come to Jesus moment and quit being a 304. She moved a thousand miles away, surprisingly, along with her father. That shocked me. When I impertinently asked why she essentially banned Nina from her own home, she laughed at me. She explained she did that when she learned that Nina and her father had been sleeping together since Nina was 13. You see I'm not such an evil stepmother after all. I never suspected a thing. I feel like the biggest fool on earth, I said. You and me both, she replied. 
I thought my husband was finally over his obsession with his daughter, after all those years, but I learned I was wrong. They had been meeting secretly behind my back and I guess yours all those years. Fortunately, we didn't have children together. That's exactly how I feel, I replied. I guess if Jeopardy had a category on understanding your wife, I would have gotten all the answers wrong. It was very sobering and enlightening to know that my book learning was of no use in navigating love, romance, and marriage. When it came to love, romance, and marriage, I was an ignorant fool. Nina's stepmother claimed that therapy had helped recover her sanity and suggested that it would help me as well. I thought about it but decided that I didn't need it. I was totally over any love I felt for Nina, which was true, but I would never get over the pain she caused me. Even after my own personal experience with a six-month marriage, I never believed any YouTube stories about the wife of 30 years, saying dear we have to talk and then informing her husband that she intends to cheat on him and expects him to put up with it and not to complain. How could a wife be that stupid? What husband would agree to that unless she had a gun to his head? How could the husband not see it coming? They must all be morons. I never believed these stories until it happened to me. Now all I can figure out is that once women begin changing life, not only do their libidos go down 50%, but so do their IDOQs. And apparently so did my IQ diminish with age, because like those other stupid husbands, I didn't have a clue this was coming. I thought that Caitlin and I were still a happy couple. At least I had been happy. My wife never had nights out with the girls, or went away on vacations without me. There were no clandestine phone calls in the middle of the night, and no new negligees in her closet, or condom wrappers under the bed. The only clue that something was amiss was my wife's credit card bills. She was spending every dollar I made, and I made a lot of them, on new furniture, a new and ground swimming pool, a new Mercedes and a great deal of jewelry. It was compulsive spending with no end in sight, despite my frequent pleas that she tone it down. The house wasn't in my name, only hers along with the first, second or third mortgages on it. I guess you could say that she was spending her way through menopause. She was the poster girl for shopping therapy. I guess I was guilty of working hard therapy. Caitlin and I met in Atlantic City six months after my annulment. I worked the night shift as a soda jerk at Hi-Hat Joe's Burger Joint on the boardwalk while I waited for the fall semester to begin at Temple University. Caitlin ordered a birch beer, and because I couldn't take my eyes from her chest which was less than 10% covered by a tiny bikini top, I overfilled the glass until it ran over. We both laughed. She told me I was cute and that she would be on the beach the next day right in front of the Ambassador Hotel. The next day, I saw her on the beach just where she told me she would be and I placed my blanket next to hers. I would later learn that the tinier the bikini, the more it cost. Hers must have cost a fortune. I was smitten and was probably drooling as once again. I couldn't take my eyes off her wet dream inspiring visually beguiling and gravity-defying chest. The bottom of her bikini covered less than the top. Caitlin smiled as she gazed at the bulge in my swimming suit that she inspired. I was afraid my rock-solid erection would punch a hole thought it. I had worked on my tan all summer, and she admired it as she asked me to apply some of my suntan lotion to her back while her friends were in the ocean. As I applied the lotion to the back of her legs, I warned her that I would never let go of her. Her only reply was, Good. I hadn't slept with a woman since my annulment, and she had only slept with a boy, once after her senior prom. How cliche I thought, but said nothing. We fixed that condition on our second date. In truth, she was the sexual aggressor, and I quickly capitulated waving my tidy whitey underpants like a white flag in surrender after I quickly removed them. We lived in different towns in Pennsylvania, about 20 miles apart. But in the fall, we were both students at Temple University in Philadelphia. She was an undergrad and I was a graduate student in secondary education with the financial support of my parents. I had had enough of the phony world and phony people in advertising. She lived in the dorms. I rented an apartment a block from campus. Her sex drive was as at least as strong as mine. We made love at least twice a day, seven days a week for the next three years except for that week when I had the flu and she made me chicken soup every night. I don't know when we found the time or energy to go to classes and graduate. I was the luckiest guy on earth. Caitlin never flirted or even looked at all the guys who followed her around Mitten Hall cafeteria like little lost puppies seeking her love, her affection, and her body. She never had the time. 
After graduation, we both taught at the same high school in Abington, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, and sometimes walked hand in hand in the hallway to the delight of our students and the annoyance of the principal. We traveled to Los Angeles when I was chosen as a contestant on the TV show Jeopardy. I was doing great, but the returning champion hit all three daily doubles and beat my $10,000 score with his $30,000. Even though I lost, I was proud of my performance and so was her father. He had a newfound appreciation of my intelligence. He was also a Jeopardy fan. Caitlin and I had saved every dime for three years, and then my father-in-law gave us the rest of a down payment for a house on condition that the house was only in my wife's name and that I quit teaching and work for him. We quickly had three children. Five years later, when my father-in-law died of a sudden heart attack, I took over my wife's family business. It was a stressful job with almost 100 employees to manage. I did a good job and within two years increased our net profit by 8%, but at a cost of working my head off. I didn't want my life centered only on business or making money, but I had no choice. I gave up kayaking, fishing, and my other hobbies. I didn't go out drinking with friends. I spent every non-working hour with my family because my family was my life. I never cheated or even flirted with another woman. I wasn't in the market for another woman. It's not like I was blind and didn't appreciate a beautiful woman, but I would never jeopardize my marriage or risk hurting my wife's feelings. Once at a supermarket, we ran into Bonnie. It was the first time I'd seen her since we were 12 years old in summer camp where we liked each other and even kissed each other on the cheek goodbye at the end of the summer. She was still adorable, and she made it clear that she thought I was also adorable. We spoke for less than one minute, before Caitlin stormed over and brought an angry end to my reunion. She read me the riot act when we returned home. She was that jealous. One year for my birthday, my kids bought me a poster from the movie The Godfather where Michael Corleone tells Fredo, never take sides against the family. It became our family mantra. I worked long hours. Over the years, I put on about 20 pounds and my hairline began receding. I didn't have time to go to a gym and I looked it. I have to admit that I let myself go. It's not like I was spending my time at bars drinking. My life was confined to work and home. My wife worked out at a gym three times a week and gained maybe five pounds since high school, though she mistakenly always thought she looked heavy. Of course, our sex life slowed down to once or twice a week, then once a week and then 25 years later less than once a month. I wanted more, but all of a sudden Caitlin didn't. She said it was hormonal. I suggested that she consult a doctor, but she refused. I suggested marriage counseling, and she laughed at me. Once. When I tried to turn her on by running my hand up her nightgown, she screamed at me and accused me of trying to assault her. She said if I ever again tried to touch her jugs, she would have me arrested. I was shocked by her accusation and never again initiated sex with her or even tried to kiss her or hold her hand. In a, he said, she said, situation the husband always goes to jail, despite there being no evidence. My wife never mentioned or perhaps never noticed my total lack of physical affection towards her. At first, I thought that my wife was suffering a mental breakdown and I begged her to seek therapeutic help but she refused. For one brief second, I wondered if she was having an affair so I checked her cell phone. It wasn't password protected, which in itself was a good sign. None of the calls were suspicious, mostly to her family, the factory where I worked, and some friends. It never dawned on me that my wife might have a secret second phone. I stopped worrying about an affair. I was guilty of being dumb and guilty of trusting my wife. Other than my first wife, she was the only girl I dated more than once, the only girl I slept with, the only girl I ever loved. I guess romantically and emotionally I was still a teenager in love. While I hoped that as she suggested, she was having a temporary hormonal crisis that would soon resolve itself. Then I prayed that we go back to normal. I couldn't imagine living without my wife, my wife as she used to be that is, not the witch with whom I now shared my home and life. I refused to install cameras and recorders in our house or her car to check on my wife. If I secretly installed them and my wife found out it would destroy what was left of our marriage. My wife even apologized for threatening to have me arrested. She claimed she had no idea why she flew off the handle like that. I was relieved but was still too cautious to touch her. I was now sure the problem was mental illness and not adultery. Every night after dinner, we religiously watched Jeopardy. Now, however, when I came up with the wrong answer, my wife made fun of me 
and said she understood why I lost when I appeared on the show and I wasn't half so smart as I thought I was. She was really mean and nasty about this and I didn't know where it came from. She had never acted like this before. Two weeks later, our youngest son drove off to begin his freshman year in college at Penn State. Before he left, he took me aside away from my wife and warned me that Caitlin had become very distant from him and hardly spoke with him for the past few months. He warned me that something was going on with her. He had no idea what it was, but implored me to keep my eyes open. He patted me on my too large belly and told me I had to join a gym and take better care of myself. Then he hugged me and left. My wife Caitlin and I were now sad empty nesters. We sat down next to the swimming pool we had just built, with the help of a giant home loan that left her with little to no equity in her home and enormous monthly payments. I was about to surprise her with tickets I bought for a Caribbean cruise. I hoped we could resurrect the love we once shared. I walked over and tried to hold her hands when she pushed me away and said, Jack, we have to talk. My wife never called me by my name. We always referred to each other as dear or honey, so I knew I was in trouble, but I had no idea how much. I hoped this talk would be about her reckless, neurotic spending of late. Jack, I've been unhappy for years, and for years I've hated being intimate with you. You don't turn me on or excite me. I'm no longer attracted to you. You're just too old, too out of shape and I hate to say it, too bald. I need someone much more vigorous, much more viral, and much younger. Now that our children are gone there's no reason for us to live this way anymore. I don't want a divorce, but I intend to continue an affair I've been having for months. You and I will still live together, but we'll have no more sex together. I'll only have sex with my lover. I can't believe you've been cheating on me. I whispered. Well, she replied, I guess Jeopardy isn't the only thing you're not so smart at. That comment sure took the wind out of my sails. How could I be so stupid when it came to women in general and my two wives in particular? I hesitated while I thought. So, you're saying that if I want any physical intimacy, I have to get a girlfriend? She placed her hands on her hips as her face turned red. If you do that, I'll destroy you, she screamed. If you need release, well, that's what your hands are for. I quickly thought of another use for my hands. I thought of putting them around her throat and squeezing until she stopped breathing and turned blue. But even though the thought brought a smile to my face, I dismissed it. I vowed to get my revenge on her and her lover, but not now. It would have to wait until I had a foolproof plan to exact total revenge without getting totally screwed myself. It meant I needed a path of revenge that did not lead back to me and an inevitable trip to Sing Sing Prison. Then I felt faint. I had a gut-wrenching flashback to the time I went through this with my first wife all those years ago. All the blood left my head and the room beginning spinning. I had to sit down before I fell down. I took some deep breaths, but I was still faint. I lowered my head for a minute or so to get some blood into it. My brain finally started working again. Who is he? I whispered. That's not important, she replied. I don't want you beating him up or worse. Why would I beat him up? I replied. You're the one cheating on me. I noticed that my wife's iPhone was next to her. I grabbed it and saw that she was recording us. I shut off the recording and checked it for messages as she tried to grab it back. I saw her recent message to Tad Smith, my 30-year-old assistant general manager. She was telling him that she was going to inform me of their romantic plans. I phoned him on her phone. When he answered, Hi, love. With out-of-control fury, I yelled, If you ever go near my wife again, I'll shoot off your balls. This isn't an empty threat. It's a promise. Oh, and you're fired. It wasn't just a promise I was making to Tad, but a promise I was making to myself. That little jerk would pay for messing up my life no matter how long it took me, no matter how much it cost me. I was getting angrier by the moment. I could already see myself killing Tad when I closed my eyes. I hung up and turned to my wife. If you get intimate, or even see him again some guy with a mask will take a baseball bat to your teeth. She began sobbing with fear. I went upstairs and packed a bag. Caitlin had composed herself. She came upstairs, drying her eyes with a tissue. Jack, forget your wounded ego and unpack your bag. I've already emptied our bank accounts so you're broke. I own this house. I own the business where you work. In short, I own you. I ignored her. I wanted to slap her, but that's what she was goading me to do so she could have me arrested. It was a good idea. I had a better idea. 
I knew how to destroy her ego and get her thrown in jail instead of me. I placed my phone in my breast pocket and recorded video. I told her that I had never cheated on her but now I was free to get a newer lovelier and younger lover. I called her an over-the-hill cheating 304 with a wrinkled face, fat bum and saggy body that no one would want after Tad stole her money. She lost her temper, walked into my trap and slapped me very hard across my face and then backhanded me again on the other side of my face. I looked in a mirror and saw two large red welts starting. I took my cell phone and locked myself in the bathroom where I called 911 to report her for spousal abuse then I punched myself very hard in my eye and nose. Twenty minutes later the police arrived. They saw the welts on my face as well as the black eye and bloody nose. She claimed she only slapped me twice and not in the eye or nose. Based on her confession of slapping me and the video I showed the police, she was arrested and spent the rest of the weekend in jail as a guest of the county crying her eyes out. On Monday I changed my will my life insurance beneficiary, etc., etc., etc. I learned that she had indeed emptied our bank accounts and I had to borrow a few thousand dollars from my brother to tide me over until my divorce lawyer could reclaim my half of the money Caitlin stole from our accounts. Her lawyer, along with her lover Tad Smith and two large goons arrived at my office three days later firing me, taking my business credit cards, the keys to my company car, and giving me five minutes to leave the building. They humiliated me in front of my co-workers, and I knew I would make Tad and my wife pay for this degrading behavior. They also served me with divorce papers and a restraining order demanding I get no closer than 500 feet to either Tad or my soon-to-be ex-wife. Tad laughed in my face and bragged that he now had the great life I used to have and he so richly deserved, and because of his giant manhood he was the new sheriff in town. What a jealous prick. Now he was the new president and offered me a severance package of three months' salary on condition that I sign a five-year non-competition clause. What an idiot. If he was smarter, he would have offered me a year's salary, but frankly I would have refused that as well. I had run her family's manufacturing business for 20 years. I didn't own any stock in it because it was owned by a trust. I treated the employees very well, and they were loyal to me. I had a great reputation for fairness and honesty in the industry among our employees, clients, suppliers, and even among my competitors. I went to Starbucks, made three phone calls, and had two job offers before my latte was even cold. I took the one in our town. On Thursday, I started work, along with a half dozen key employees who quit working for my wife's company and joined me. It wasn't just their loyalty to me that drove them to quit. They all despised Tad and knew he was an idiot who would run the company into the ground in no time because he treated our employees, our suppliers, and even our clients like they were dirt left by a dog on the bottom of his expensive Gucci loafers. That's a roadmap for running a business into the dirt and destroying it. My new place of employment had an on-site gym for the use of employees. Now that I didn't have a wife to rush home to, I spent one hour there every day after work. My hairline still receded, but the large spare tire I once called my stomach also receded. I wasn't going to win any bodybuilding contests, but I looked damn good for a man my age according to my children. I chose to believe them even though the vision they held of me was optimistic. Our children were shocked and didn't speak with their mother for months. When she phoned them, they only said, never take sides against the family, and hung up. I pleaded with them to see a counselor, but they refused. Sometimes they could be as stubborn as their mother. When after she begged them, they arrived at her house for Thanksgiving, they saw Tad and started to leave. At that point Tad warned them that if they left, he would demand their mother cut them off financially for good. He bragged that he was now in charge of the family because as he repeatedly said, he was the new sheriff in town. I love those kids. Before they left my oldest daughter and youngest son walked over to Tad when he was alone and said, you'd better avoid dark alleys or garages. When the dust settles, my dad will beat the shit out of you and possibly cut off your dick. Or maybe we will. Less than a week later, Caitlin informed our children that at Tad's insistence she had written them out of her will and would no longer give them financial assistance. I was more infuriated than they were. I bought a burner phone and played a recording of I Shot the Sheriff over it as I called Tad every month at my former home and played the song for him. I never spoke a word. I was told by friends who still worked for Tad that after Thanksgiving he was always protected by security guards when he was in the company garage. He was clearly rattled by my son's threat and my phone calls. 
His attempt to file a restraining order against me was thrown out of court because he had no evidence. A few months later I was divorced and my ex-wife paid me a very large one-time settlement instead of continuing alimony. It took her entire savings and a bank loan to pay me. I took my children and their significant others to Aspen with a tiny bit of that money to ski and have an epic snowball fight. As I threw each snowball, I closed my eyes and pretended it was aimed at my ex-wife or her boyfriend. It felt great, but it didn't release my anger or need for revenge. It only increased it. Nine months after that, her company was on its last legs. It seems that a month after I cashed my wife's settlement check, a mysterious virus erased all the files on the company's computers including their off-site backups. Their tax information, accounts receivables and payables couldn't be recovered. They were starved for cash, and since their suppliers weren't getting paid, they cut them off. The way Tad had treated them hadn't helped his cause. The IRS audited them because their employee withholding tax hadn't been paid for three months and froze their bank's accounts. The $10,000 in untraceable cash that I gave to the Russian computer hacker to wreak havoc on my enemies was the best money I'd ever spent. The financial fallout hurt her much more than a few broken teeth. She could no longer make the house payments on the three mortgages and had to sell the house and her Mercedes-Benz. She and her a-hole boyfriend now lived in a one-bedroom apartment in a decaying neighborhood. Using my 401k and a straw man who fronted for me, I bought our former house from the bank at much less than it was worth. I felt vindicated because over the years I had made a lot of improvements at my own expense. I turned that house into my personal castle before my wife threw me out. I also purchased her Mercedes from dealer she sold it to. My new employer and I bought my ex-wife's company for a song. I hired a computer genius for a fortune to restore all the files on the company's computers for my personal backup. A 10-year-old could have done it, but I had to pretend it took a genius in case of a lawsuit. I phoned or dined with each client to re-establish relationships. I was often met with praise and told stories of how inept my replacement had been. Invoices were immediately sent out and the money immediately began flowing back in. I personally visited each supplier with a check for what they were owed and they all resumed shipments. I had a lot of friends in the industry and her boyfriend was blackballed and couldn't get another job. I never injured my former's wife lover physically. I inflicted only psychological and financial revenge and I loved every minute of it. I thought I was finally over her cheating until two years later while driving to a business meeting. I ran into them at self-service gas station as Tad was filling up his battered old Kia and I filled up my former wife's former Mercedes. I spoke quickly to my secretary who was in my car. I snuck up behind Tad and at the top of my lungs yelled boo, and he pissed himself. What a brave man you have. I smirked at my wife through the window of his car. You'll have to change his diaper. My revenge was complete when my new 25-year-old gorgeous secretary exited my car and came over to us. I hadn't hired her for her looks. It was just an added bonus. I put my arms around her and kissed her, and she kissed me back with surprising passion. Then I thanked my ex-wife for freeing me to get a newer, firmer, prettier, younger lover. My ex-wife's eyes were flooded in tears as I drove off in her former Mercedes that she loved so much. In truth, my secretary wasn't my lover. She was just my secretary doing me a favor by kissing me in front of my ex. That night, I took my secretary and her husband to the best restaurant in town on me as repayment of the favor. I agreed that she could bring along Vivian. Her widowed and I was to learn equally gorgeous mother. I discovered that Vivian was very personable and funny. She taught ethics at a local community college. That made me believe that she was a woman I could trust unlike my two ex-wives. We hit it off. Vivian and I aren't married or even living together full-time. But we spend every weekend at my place, except when we travel with her children and mine for an annual ski trip and snowball fight in Aspen. My youngest son always poses a photo of me hugging my still happily married secretary, pretending she's my girlfriend and emails it to his mother. My thirst for revenge should have been satisfied, but it wasn't. I really wanted to smash Tad's face in with my fists. I constantly dreamed about it. I knew it was a one-way ticket to prison, but I had to do something to the jerk. I finally decided to use my head instead of my fists. It wouldn't be perfect revenge plan. But then few things in life are perfect, except of course my children. At least in my mind they were perfect. 
a quick weekend trip to an upscale hotel in New York, and a few phone calls to escort services and boxing gyms produced the introductions I needed. We were all at the Aspen Airport waiting to return home when I made a phone call from a nearby payphone. When I heard the news on the phone, I had to run to a bathroom. I was laughing so hard I was afraid I would wet myself. I hadn't been this happy in several years. While my family and I were 2,000 miles away from Philadelphia and had bulletproof alibis, Tad was at a motel with an absolutely beautiful woman he had met last week. After I paid her and her giant-sized husband $5,000 each to seduce, entrap, and physically settle with Tad. A very, very large man claiming to be her husband barged in and beat the crap out of Tad, with a special emphasis on the area between his legs. Then as the man and woman made a hasty escape back to New York on Amtrak, Caitlin, who had been informed on what was going on, barged in and seeing what Tad had been doing continued beating him until she was arrested. It is never a good idea to take sides against my family. My wife contacted our children and tried to reconnect with them and borrow money from them. She even offered to put them back in her will. They laughed at her because she was penniless and had nothing to leave them. She was so desperate that she even phoned me begging for reconciliation, or at least some money. I'd spent over $10,000 destroying her, and did in fact feel some guilt over it because of all the years I had unconditionally loved her. I gave my children $10,000 to give to their mother claiming it came from them, not me. Surprisingly, that act of charity gave me more happiness and closure than having Tad beaten up, well, almost as much. Dear listeners, these two amazing stories have been shared by Ronald Burns. He is an amazing writer and a very dear friend to us. Also has been a great contributor towards our channel. Please support him on Amazon. We have shared the links in the comments section below.